Hey guys, I wanted to start this video off with a quick promotion. On my main channel, I uploaded a video about Thomas Jefferson's idea that we should not be bound by tradition or the institutions of the past. In this, he includes the United States Constitution. If you guys want to hear more about why he thought this or what exactly he thought, please check out that video. It'll be linked at the top of this description. Anyway, back to this reaction. Hey everybody, and welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today we'll be watching The Siege of Antioch, 1097 to 98, by Kings and Generals. Uh, it's been a while since we last reacted to Kings and Generals' First Crusade series, but it's been a bit since they last released one. Last time we saw the rather dramatic Crusader victory at Doraleum, and then we saw them finally moving across Anatolia, getting actually close to the Holy Land. Uh, it seems now we're getting to Antioch, which is uh, a pretty important city to Christianity and to uh, the ancient world in general. Uh, you know, the name Antioch pops up a lot in Roman and Byzantine history, particularly, uh, you know, ancient Roman and Byzantine history. Uh, I'm not sure what's going on with it uh, at this point in 1097, but, you know, we're finally uh, seeing some crusader success as they move closer to the Holy Land. Uh, so I'm excited to get into this one. If you guys end up enjoying this video, I'd appreciate it if you would check out my Patreon, which is linked down below. And without any further ado, let's jump into this reaction. In our last episode on the First Crusade, the Crusaders narrowly avoided disaster near the plains of Doraleum. Mm. So far, the campaign was a well-coordinated success, as the largely due to the efforts of the Byzantines. I mean, now, to be fair, these crusaders are far more experienced uh, and well-trained than the, uh, let's say, the People's Crusade or the earlier crusaders we saw uh, earlier in this series who were an absolute disaster. But I think even these crusaders, without the unifying efforts of the Byzantines, they would uh, be in a lot of trouble. I mean, the Byzantines have provided a lot of important logistics, planning, organization for this campaign, uh, and they've really been essential to uh, the success that the Crusaders are now seeing. The movement of the Byzantine and Crusader forces secured Western and Central Anatolia. Mm. The next goal of the campaign was the impregnable stronghold erected by Seleucus, the site of the first Christian church founded by St. Peter and right. fortified by Justinian, Antioch. It important city. Like I said in the intro, Antioch was an important city both to Christianity and to uh, the ancient Roman Empire. In 1098, this great city would also become the place where crusading as we know it today was born, amidst mm. one of the most brutal sieges in Ooh. history. Interesting. You might say crusading was reborn in a different way much later all the way in 2002, when our sponsor, Medieval Total War, was released. One of the yes. classics... Getting a Total War sponsor, very nice. Um, all right, here we go. Uh, so you guys know the deal, shout out to Kings and Generals. Go check out their video, which is linked uh, in the description of my video. Uh, go check out their sponsor, give them a like, subscribe to their channel, show them uh, some support for making such fantastic content in their quick and experience one of the classics or relive old glories at this limited time price. During the summer of 1097, the Seljuk scorched earth policy, coupled with the difficult terrain, stripped the Westerners from their most powerful tool, their heavy war mounts. Mm. Some fell from cliffs and others perished from lack of water. That's true. I mean, we saw the uh, Crusader and Byzantine victory at Doraleum, but uh, I do remember that the, you know, their crossing uh, over Anatolia was pretty brutal. Some harsh terrain, uh, the horses were dying off. It was a pretty difficult time for them. Forcing many knights to ride oxen, mules, or simply travel on foot, while goats, sheep, and dogs were used as pack animals. Soldiers were so dehydrated that on the rare occasion that water sources were found, Many suffocated themselves as they drank too much. Jeez. After arriving at Heraclea, the army divided into two. The bulk of the forces took the longer route north through Cappadocia and then east, circling the formidable Antitaurus, while a smaller contingent took the direct approach via the Cilician Gates. 
This strategy resulted from careful and cunning planning on behalf of Alexios, who wanted to ensure a base of operations which could be used for supplies and later reinforcement. But like I said, most of the planning and logistics have been done by the Byzantines under their emperor, Alexios Komnenos. They have really been in control of this operation, um, which is good because they sort of called for it in the first place. I mean, this was their call to the West for aid. Um, and we've seen previously what happens when the Crusaders are out of control. Uh, very, you know, very much not a good situation. Um, though I fear we may see more Crusader chaos later in this series as the Byzantines sort of start to lose control over them. But so far, the Byzantines have maintained a pretty firm hand over them. But also provides us with an idea of how well disciplined and coordinated the Council of Princes really was. Yeah. The expedition in Cilicia was commanded by Baldwin of Boulogne and Tancred, the supporting side characters of their more renowned relatives mm. Godfrey and Beaumont, who now had the opportunity to prove their worth. Tancred led no more than 200 men, but was Whoa. accompanied by an Armenian guide, allowing him to arrive at Tarsus before Baldwin, who had between 300 and 500 troops. Pretty what small used horses. to be the capital of the region, and the place where Mark Antony first met Cleopatra, was wow. now a meagre town, which lost its port to centuries of sedimentation. On September 21st, 1097, the Seljuk garrison rushed out to meet Tancred in open battle, but they were easily beaten back. Mm. The Norman then taunted the enemy, claiming that he was merely the vanguard of a massive Christian force. The following morning, he received their surrender and <laughs> raised his banner on the citadel. Hey, there you go, nice. That same day, Baldwin arrived and feasted beneath the city walls alongside the Normans. Despite being absent from any engagements, he suggested that they were to share the spoils equally, and since he had the larger force, Tancred had to begrudgingly accept. His mm. banner was replaced and thrown into a nearby marsh. Oh, Within wow. hours, he gathered his troops and rode east. Um, See, there's still, there's still tension there. I mean, we just talked about how well organized the Crusaders have been up until this point under the leadership of the Byzantines, but even so, there's still that tension because, let's be honest, a lot of these Crusaders uh, are not, you know, fully inspired by religious fervor, although that's absolutely an element, but particularly those at the top, they want to gain territory, they want to gain riches, they want to gain glory, so there's going to be competition over that always. A month later, at dusk, a force of 300 southern Italian Normans arrived in order to reinforce Tancred, but were refused entry into Tarsus, Ooh. forcing them to make camp under the walls. Unseen, the bulk of the Seljuk garrison slipped through the night and butchered them as they slept, before riding off into the distance. Rough. A rumour began circulating that Baldwin was actually responsible, and fearing for his life, he locked himself in a tower waiting for the storm to pass. See, I mean, and this is some of the sort of ridiculous politicking and power grabbing that we saw when the Crusaders all arrived at Constantinople and Alexios Komnenos had to, like, you know, desperately try to prevent them from either invading the city or attacking each other or attacking his forces. You know, whenever they settle down or they conquer something, there is a lot of tension between these men. Before installing his own garrison and leaving a week later, but the bloody stain would never be forgotten. Yeah. Meanwhile, Tancred had made it to Mamistra, where he was warmly welcomed by the local Armenians, who accepted <laughs> him as their new ruler after the Seljuk garrison fled. Like Fair. clockwork, Baldwin arrived a few days later and camped near the city, but this time Tancred would not back down. Huh. The first Crusader confrontation was brief and more of a brawl than a battle, some men were seriously injured, but no one was killed, and both sides made peace the next day, before going on their separate ways. I mean, to be honest, that could have gone a lot worse, and given the track record of these Crusaders, you would have expected it to go a lot worse. I mean, you, you could have seen a battle of much larger proportions and far more casualties, so just some pettiness in a brawl, and to be fair, like, I can't blame Tancred for saying, yeah, no, I'm not helping you out this time. But 
That's not a terrible outcome compared to last time. Tancred garrisoned Mamistra with 50 men, secured the port of Alexandretta, and met up with the main crusading host on its way to Antioch after establishing friendly relations and a stable base in Armenian Cilicia. As for Baldwin, his adventure was just beginning. Mm. While the rest of the crusaders prepared to head south, he was guided by an Armenian named Bagret, who promised great riches and fertile lands to the east. Accompanied by just 100 knights, he took a page from Tonkred's book and was able to capture the towns of Telbashir and Ravendel with little more than a bluff. Oh, I mean, hey, if it works, might as well use that tactic for yourself. Looks like Baldwin is, uh, you know, he's going off in his own way. Like I said, a lot of these guys are looking out to acquire territory and riches for themselves, so it's not too surprising. Initially, he rewarded Bagrat with lordship over the latter city. But before long, a plot was uncovered, and Baldwin hunted him down and brutally tortured him. Jeez. News of these conquests soon spread, reaching the ear of Thoros, the Armenian ruler of Edessa, who was barely holding on to power. The two men formed an alliance, formalized in a bizarre ritual, during which both men stripped to their waist and embraced each other under a long shirt, sealing a union between father and adopted son. Uh, that's pretty weird. <laughs> with his but i mean uh, you know the ceremony sounds very odd to me of course um but uh, that sort of political adoption adopting another man as your son um you know that was not rare uh, at least in ancient politics uh, which i know a little bit more about but you you see uh that kind of thing fairly frequently in in, in that region um you know uh, adopting someone as your son or something of that manner would show that, you know, you have that close relationship, you trust them, um, there's loyalty going both ways, and it, and it was a political move as we're seeing here. His newfound Latin son, Thoros dispatched Baldwin at the head of an Armenian force to deal with his Seljuk rival from Samoseta. Wow. On his return to Edessa, the Crusader uncovered a plot by Edessi nobles aiming to assassinate Thoros. Baldwin neither aided nor turned them in, hoping to see where the wind blows, hmm. and in March 1098, the locals rebelled against their ruler and ripped him to pieces. <laughs> well, you know, uh, I guess that, that political adoption didn't mean too much to Baldwin, who was not too loyal to his uh, new adopted father. <laughs> Baldwin immediately jumped on the opportunity and established an iron grip over the city, which would become the base of the future County of Edessa, the first crusader state, carved out wow. with just a hundred men and questionable morality. Interesting. Obviously, I've heard of the crusader states before, but uh, I did not know that this was the first of the lot. This is uh, very interesting circumstances, as kings and generals said, of, you know, founded on questionable morality and also kind of like a side quest from the main crusade <laughs> but it wasn't really that related to what the rest of the crusaders were doing baldwin went off on his own and ended up with this new crusader state it's a you know very odd set of circumstances i would say meanwhile the main body of the crusader army took mirage on october 10th of 1097 and prepared to attack antioch mm. At its peak, it was the third city of the Roman Empire, but yeah. its role in the region was now diminished due to the rise of neighboring Aleppo and Damascus. Mm. The Latins could have taken Jerusalem without it, but if they wanted to keep it, they needed this strategic target, which had immense value to all Christians. Yeah. Luckily for them, those same cities were now fighting for dominance, while Antioch stood alone in the backdrop of the fragmented Seljuk Empire. Okay, I was saying that, uh, you know, I'm familiar with Antioch's historical role in the region, but I was unfamiliar with what it was up to in 1097. Seems like it had lost some of its prominence that it once held, but still a very symbolically important city um, to Christians, or even if you're familiar with the history of the region. Uh, it seems like it could be a strategically important city as well, uh, at least if they want to hold, capture and hold Jerusalem. Ruled by its ambitious and very capable Turkoman named Yankee Sian, 
who struggled to preserve his domain amidst civil war, pockets of Shiite Arabs, numerous Christian subjects, and now an impending zealous army with quite the reputation. <laughs> yeah. But now, let's look at what he had going for him. A very capable Seljuk garrison of 5,000 men, alongside okay. 800 soldiers, incredibly well-built walls, 20 meters high and 2 meters thick, covering a large area, including a hill featuring a formidable citadel 500 meters above the city. And uh, we've seen a lot of these ancient cities like Antioch, one of their, you know, main things they have going for them are their impressive defenses built back in the day by the Romans or the Byzantines back when, you know, they had the resources to construct these impressive walled cities. Um, and they still stand to this, well, to 1097. Um, and that's been a big benefit for a lot of these cities that are now held by the Seljuk Turks. Um, these walls built sometimes hundreds uh, or even more than a thousand years ago. From which the defenders could track every Frankish move. There were foothills which could be turned into farmland. But above all, the geography made this city nearly impossible to take. The city was protected by a mountain to the east, while the Orontes River flowed in a way that if an army wanted to surround Antioch, it had to cross it, separating mm. the camp in three on its west and south side. In mid-October, the leaders of the crusade gathered together to discuss how they would tackle this challenge. Tetikias came forward and proposed that they fortify themselves to the north and harass the garrison from afar, a long and drawn-out strategy that worked in 969 during the Byzantine Reconquista of the Macedonian dynasty period. But okay. the majority decided on a more direct approach. Raymond of Toulouse was convinced that if the Crusaders took too long, many would desert during the winter. And to be fair, I think he has a good point. I mean, it makes sense that the Byzantines would... Um, be okay with a more drawn-out strategy. You know, this is their empire. Um, they're trying to reclaim their territory. So ideally, <laughs> they're going to be here for a long time. You know, they want to resettle these areas, regarrison them. So they don't necessarily mind if it takes them a while. But, you know, the Crusaders, well, they're just visiting. You know, they've come a long way to conquer these territories. Um, and, you know, I think it's right that if... You wait a long time, particularly through winter, a lot of the Crusaders might begin to desert if they're not seeing the glory, riches, conquest that was promised. So, I mean, I, I understand both sides because both sides are, you know, arguing based on their own interest. But for the Crusaders, they definitely rather prefer uh, a quicker conquest. Something which had already started to occur during the difficult trek in the mountains. Satellite fortresses were captured, with contingents securing Bagres, Arta, and the Iron Bridge, opening mm. the road to the coveted city. But once the Crusaders met the imposing defenses high above them, all hopes of a direct assault dissipated. Yeah. 30,000 Latins, half of which were non-combatants, made camp against just three of the six main gates on the 20th of October, centered around the northwestern corner. Buemar took up position in front of the St. Paul Gate, while the remaining Italian Normans, led by Tancred, camped behind. The northern French blockaded the Dog Gate, Godfrey of Bouillon held the Gate of the Duke, and the mm. Byzantine contingent acted as reserves. Siege warfare was a staple of medieval European warfare, which also came with certain traditions. Namely, the first banner to fly above the walls of a newly conquered city represented a strong claim to it. And it is here that we find that Beaumont was starting to show some of his ambition, being the first to arrive and positioning his forces against the most crucial gate of the three. Yeah, and I mean, we talked about this earlier in this episode, but that tension between these, uh, you know, these leaders, these crusaders, is probably always going to re-emerge because uh, it seems Beaumont in particular is sort of seizing on his ambition, but this... Uh, is an ambitious group of guys. I mean, they've come a long way, and they haven't come a long way for nothing. They want, like I said, they want their glory, they want their conquest, and, you know, obviously they're seizing that from 
uh, the Arabs and the Turks of the region, but they're also competing with each other. And of course, we're seeing that as a factor in these conflicts. In the first two weeks, both sides were sizing each other up, which resulted in the calmest period, during which Yagisian sent out his sons to search for aid, and the Crusaders enjoyed plentiful supplies from the rich valley. Fearing mutiny, the Seljuks expelled a large portion of its Christian population, while many mm. Armenians took the chance to visit the Crusader camp and report back to Yagisian what they saw. Suddenly this army that took down the Sultanate of Rum didn't seem so threatening, and mm. the strategy changed entirely. Arrows were shot from atop the citadel, while mounted archers sallied out and harassed the camp, racing back across the bridge when given chase. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, those non-combatants are really puffing up the Crusaders' numbers a lot. If you exclude them, they said 30,000, half of which were non-combatants. We've got a force of about 15,000 Crusaders against, I think, a force of, I think they said, 8,000 in the city. Um, not to mention, the city has very impressive defenses. So, I mean, this could absolutely be a struggle for the Crusaders. Uh, it's not like they have some sort of overwhelming advantage. Harim, a nearby fortress, was still in Muslim hands and was used as a base from which raids were continuously launched. By mid-November, the winter cold was setting in, supplies were waning, and heavy rains poured on the Christian force. The Crusaders were putting barely any pressure on the city, while the city continued to receive rich caravans from the south. Mm. In order to turn the tide, the Latins built a bridge over the Orontes River by tying small boats together, which was difficult to cross. The maneuver allowed the Crusaders access to the sea via the crucial port of St. Simeon, which received regular shipments of supplies from Byzantine Cyprus. This entry point allowed the Franks to send and receive letters from the west, resulting okay. in a rare collaboration between Bishop Adhemar and the exiled Patriarch of Jerusalem who drafted a letter asking the West to send a new wave of reinforcements to the Holy mm. Land. On the 17th of November, 13 Genoese ships even made it to the port, bringing vital craftsmen and materials, which were used to build a fort on the slopes of Mount Storin. I mean, this is some pretty good stuff. We've seen, particularly with the march across Antioch, the Crusaders have really struggled to stay supplied. And having this sort of access from this port it seems like they're really resupplying, asking for reinforcements, some stuff that they have been needing for a while. Because while I think the Byzantines have handled the logistics and organization pretty excellently, there's only so much they can do. I mean, they're pretty far away from their heartland at this point. So something like this, I mean, that's a pretty good advantage to have. Old Malregard. Next, Bermor was chosen to deal with Harim, which he did by employing step tactics, namely hmm. a feigned retreat. Wow. This drew out the small garrison, which was then smashed by a... How about that? He's learning from his rivals. I mean, that's pretty smart. ...a heavy cavalry charge, personally led by Bermor. Hmm. The fortress didn't fall, but its garrison was neutralized. According to eyewitness reports from the Crusader camp, those whom we captured were led before the city gate and were beheaded to grieve the Turks who were in the city. Ooh. The garrison immediately responded in kind, according to the same report. Alas, how many Christians, Greeks, Syrians and Armenians who lived in the city were killed by the maddened Turks. With the Franks looking on, they threw outside the walls the heads of those killed with their catapults and slings. This especially grieved our people. Yeah, but if, I mean, if you execute a bunch of Turks in front of the city walls, you're going to get the same thing back. Um, yeah, I mean, we're seeing some of this uh, brutality that the Crusades are known for. Uh, I, you know, I know we have a lot more of that to come. I worry <laughs> what's going to happen in the future when the Crusaders start capturing more important uh, cities in the region. But we're sort of getting a taste of that already. The Greek Christian Patriarch of Antioch was regularly suspended from the walls upside down, while the guards beat his feet with iron rods. Ooh. Both sides were determined to win, no matter the cost. And it's an interesting situation because, 
uh, as has been mentioned several times in this video, and as uh, you know, I've emphasized throughout this series, you know, the Byzantines are trying to reconquer territory that was once theirs, which means that a lot of the inhabitants of this region are Christian. You know, um, there are uh, Seljuk Muslim, Seljuk Turks garrisoning all these cities, and some of the inhabitants certainly would be Muslim, but a lot of the inhabitants are Christians. So, um, you know. That's something that the Crusaders kind of have to keep in mind, is that they could incur a lot of Christian civilian casualties if the Seljuk Turks want to uh, want to do that. I mean, um, and of course we've seen beforehand the Byzantines have tried to take actions to protect those civilians and prevent any sort of massacres from the Seljuks against Christian civilians, but the Crusaders seem a little less concerned about that. I mean... You know, the scene we just saw with Bohemond executing the Turks in front of the city, they must have known that that would lead to a massacre of Christians within the walls uh, of that city. So, you know, I think uh, the Crusaders are a little less careful <laughs> and have a little less regard for, uh, I guess, civilian life than we saw from the Byzantines. With the coming of December, the shipments became infrequent and hunger began to set in. Foraging parties ventured far from the camp and many were picked off, never to be seen again. Merchants from Cilicia became one of the few lifelines for many, but mm. greed and the dangers of making the journey uh -oh. led the traders to jack up their prices, which caused mass desertion amongst the poor. Those who could not afford to feed themselves were losing health which led to the rapid spread of disease, mm. causing the death of a fifth of the army. Ooh, that's rough. After celebrating a grim Christmas, Beaumont and Robert of Flanders left camp on a mission to find supplies, taking 400 knights and at least as many infantry with them east. The expedition did manage to find a significant amount of forage in the fertile area of Jabal as samak raiding mm. nearby villages. While camping near the town of Albara, the group made one of the worst strategic mistakes one can make. Jeez. They didn't post scouts and suddenly realized that a 10,000 strong army was on the horizon. Uh -oh. The combined force of Damascus and Homs, led by the formidable Atabeg, took 10. Yeah, I mean, that is a uh, pretty sizable army to, uh, to miss. I mean, you don't post scouts, this is what happens, but it's not like it was a force of like a thousand or two thousand Seljuks. I mean, this is pretty substantial. Megan was equally surprised to find the raiding party on the <laughs> 31st of December after they answered Antioch's call for aid. Yeah. Robert instantly rallied his knights and charged against the overwhelming force, stopping the Muslim force. Wow. Burmore stayed back, pouncing at the right moment as the enemy was trying to flank his ally. Rather than risk failure for themselves and the entire crusade, the men retreated back into camp abandoning all of the supplies they had managed to gather, as well as those who were on Ooh. foot. Yeah, I mean, that's that's rough. That's a pretty big sacrifice to make. But at the same time, um, I mean, if they tried to fight this force head on, I, I think they would certainly fall. So they made a difficult decision uh, and retreated. Such was the lack of war steeds that most of the cavalry chased after a single horse, who had lost his rider and galloped west. Jeez. When the dust settled, the troops from Damascus regrouped and attacked the fleeing footmen, killing or capturing most of them. The blow inflicted by the Crusader force was not fatal, but it did discourage the already disinterested Muslim troops from continuing their expedition, so hmm. they headed back to Damascus. Oh, well, I guess it worked then. <laughs> they didn't really need to do too much to... Uh... Uh, for the Muslim force to say, you know what, we're not interested, we're going back home. <laughs> Over the next few days, Robert returned to pick up a few stragglers and supplies. But overall, despite preventing utter disaster, the mission failed to resupply mm. the camp. Yeah, that's tough. But Burmore and Robert's absence didn't go unnoticed. The all-seeing citadel reported the troop movement to Yagisiyan, who ordered the garrison to sally out and attack the Crusader camp. To make matters worse, Robert of Normandy was absent, visiting a nearby port, and Godfrey was ill. Oh. Rushing out of the bridge gate, 
The Seljuks charge. <laughs> Who's going to be in charge then? Adamar? <laughs> uh, I guess we still have the Byzantines in reserve. ...at the Provencal camp, where they met Raymond of Toulouse. After ah. a quick engagement, the garrison force began to flee, as the southern French gave chase. Upon approaching the bridge gate, more enemies from both sides emerged, turning the attack into a rout. Men snatched riders from their saddles and pulled at their horses' tails, killing 15 knights and 20 footmen. Damn. Amidst the chaos, the bannerman of Bishop Adama, the spiritual leader of the crusade selected by Pope Urban himself, was mm. slain. The next day, the prized banner was flown atop the wall of Antioch, Ooh. taunting the besiegers, who saw the flag depicting the Virgin Mary and felt like a legion who had lost its eagle. I'm sure, yeah. I mean, I'm glad they talked about the eagle standard uh, from the legions, because that would have been the comparison I drew as well. Uh, you know, losing your standard or an important uh, banner. You know, that's always a pretty big loss, uh, a pretty big hit to morale, uh, particularly if it holds uh, religious importance, which this one does. I'm sure the Crusaders would have been um, upset and, and probably pretty frustrated to see that. The turn of the year signaled the lowest point of the Crusade. After crossing thousands of kilometers and enduring countless attacks and terrible weather, the Crusaders were nearing their breaking point. An eyewitness reports, at that time, the famished ate the shoots of bean seeds growing in the fields, and Jeez. many kinds of herbs unseasoned with salt, also <laughs> thistles, which, being not well cooked because of the deficiency of firewood, pricked the tongues of those eating them. Ooh. Also horses, asses, camels, dogs, and rats. The poorer ones even ate the skins of the beasts and the seeds of grain found in manure. Yeah, so we can see our crusaders are getting pretty desperate. Um, you know, they're uh, running low. I mean, we sort of began the siege by saying, oh, they're getting resupplied again, but that's sort of fallen off. They've struggled to gather uh, supplies and resources. Um, it must be pretty demoralizing to be in this situation. You've come so far from where you started. I mean, of course, most of these crusaders took off from France or Italy or... Um, you know, Germany, any of the German states, and they've traveled all this way, and now they've gotten stuck at this siege that they wanted to avoid, and they're starving, even after seeing some successes against uh, the Seljuks. Uh, I imagine that's a demoralizing and frustrating position to be in. Um, you know, something has to give, or something has to change, or, you know, uh, I don't know if they're going to make it, so I guess we'll see where it goes from here. Simultaneously, the men witnessed a comet and aurora, felt an earthquake, and interpreted the signs as God's displeasure. Uh -oh. It was at this crucial point when the clergy stepped up and mm. decided to restore the faith by blaming it all on the sins of those involved. We believed that these misfortunes befell the Franks and that they were not able for so long a time to take the city because of their sins. Not only dissipation, but also avarice, or pride, or rapaciousness corrupted them. Bishop Adhemar took measures into his own hands, and began advocating that all women should be expelled from the camp, and the rest <laughs> should fast for three days, and form a procession around the city's walls. I mean, look, a fast is a, a pretty good way to get around <laughs> having no food, you know. Uh, I mean, it's a good morale booster because, on one hand, um, you can look at it as we have no supplies, we're starving, we're eating rats. On the other hand, and this is how Adamar is trying to frame it, you can say we are fasting for the Lord. This is going to contribute to our victory. Now, you're still not going to be eating, and that's of course not good for your physical health and your strength. But at the very least, you're getting some sort of moral satisfaction. Uh, and, and hopefully this can motivate the Crusaders to sort of pick themselves back up. Theft and fornication were forbidden, and anyone who broke the rules was publicly punished. Around Damn. this time, a man and woman were caught in the act of adultery before being stripped and whipped for the whole army to see. Ooh. These measures generally had a positive effect in restoring morale and discipline to the camp. Oh uh, well, I guess if that's what it takes. Um, to me, it seems pretty brutal, and of course that would not be any sort of motivation for me, but... 
if you're a you know genuinely sincere Christian, then uh, and you you get these supposed signs from God, then I, you would probably would genuinely believe that. Oh my God! Like <laughs> our sins are causing this loss. Um, God is displeased with us, and that's what the bishops are telling you, Adamar, and that's your closest connection to the Lord Himself. So. Um, I, I suppose you would probably agree with the, a crackdown on discipline. You know, we need biblical discipline in this camp. We need to crack down on adultery and all these other sins. Um, like I said, I don't, you know, obviously I don't believe that way. Also, this is a thousand years later, so uh, that would, you know, I don't relate very much to that. But you can definitely understand how these crusaders would uh, view it that way. But there were still some who deserted the cause, including none other than Peter the Hermit, who was caught wow. trying to leave during the night. But by <laughs> far the most impactful departure... I mean, to be honest, I'm surprised that Peter had even made it up until this point. Um, I mean, he was a pretty terrible leader <laughs> to begin with. Um, I mean, his people's crusade mainly caused a bunch of... Uh, unfair killings, massacres of civilians, a bunch of stupid battles, looting. Um, so, you know, he did not do a good job at all. I'm surprised he even made it until this point. ...was that of Byzantine general Tatikius. Seeing the conditions reach an all-time low, the man who acted as quartermaster and representative of Alexios pledged to sail to Constantinople and come back with ships full of supplies. Mm. To make a strong statement, he even left all of his belongings in the camp. But okay, I mean, I, I see what you're doing. I, you, you know, you want to go get more supplies that are desperately needed, but at the same time, you are the representative of the Byzantine Empire. I mean, you are uh, the one person who is enforcing Byzantine interests, keeping an eye out for Byzantine interests. If you're not there, I sort of worry <laughs> about what's going to happen in his absence. For reasons which will become clear later, the shipments arrived, but the general did not. Wow. Writing with the benefit of hindsight, every Frankish chronicler will condemn both the emperor and his general, and many of their reports failed to mention these dozens of shipments, which allowed the siege to even reach this point. Interesting. It was now late January of 1098, and Burmore himself threatened to leave the campaign, <laughs> stating that he lacked the funds to pay for his soldiers which Damn. led to creating a common war chest, sponsored by Remor, aimed at financing the purchase <laughs> and maintenance of mounts. To ensure the army's cohesion, all Crusader leaders pledged to stay in the camp for seven years, or until Antioch was taken. Jeez. Uh, I mean, I, I doubt that most of them would have lived up to that pledge, but that's quite a pledge to take. I know that Sieges can take a long time, but that's definitely committing yourself to the long haul. Um, it also seems, I guess, um, I mean, the Byzantine influence is now gone from the situation. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what happened. Seems like kings and generals was hinting at something that they might explain later, but uh, the Crusaders have been left. Um, you know, apparently they're kind of running out of money. They're fairly low on supplies. They have to work something out. They have to work together, which they're doing relatively well despite the tensions between them uh, but I'm still not sure how they're going to get around this siege or if they are going to get around this siege. The garrison never stopped harassing the crusaders and during one of the many skirmishes a glimmer of hope was born as a high-ranking Seljuk nobleman was captured. Mm. After learning that his family commanded one of the towers the Latins negotiated secret access to their tower as ransom but Yaki Siyan uncovered the plot and ah. relieved the family from their command. Close. The crusaders began torturing their high-profile prisoner, but to no avail. Close, they almost had it there. If they could have managed to get that through, the siege would have ended right that moment. They would have been able to storm into the city and take it, but um, Yagi Siyan, you know, he's too smart for that. He's, he's keeping an eye out. Just when things couldn't get any worse, the first days of February brought the news that a new army was approaching Antioch from the east. Ridwan of Aleppo gathered 12,000 men in order to lift the siege and uh -oh. gave the council an impossible task. 
The answer was in the form of 700 knights, riding the last healthy steeds the Crusaders could muster Jesus. under the command of Beaumont. Yeah, this is getting, uh, I mean, pretty desperate at this point for the Crusaders. I'm, I mean, I, you know, I'm not sure how they're going to make it through this. This is a really, really bad situation. This was a big step, taken under desperation and based on his previous successes. Yeah. With no infantry to slow him down, the Norman set out and hid his men behind a hill near the Iron Bridge, separating his force into six squadrons. From the I mean, he's far outnumbered, but I will say we have seen the effectiveness of these Crusader Knights before. They've won battles in which they have been badly outnumbered, but with their you know heavily armored steeds and their heavy armor, their their training, their experience, you know they have seen success before. So. While it is extremely desperate, particularly considering the lack of horses, uh, it's not a lost cause yet. There, the Latins waited for the long column moving in from Aleppo. On the morning of February 9th, Ridwan was marching down the road with two detachments as a vanguard away from his main force. Mm. Beaumont could have easily held a defensive position at the bridge, but instead he sprung his ambush, ordering five of his squadrons to charge directly at the column while okay. he held back. One eyewitness described these first minutes of battle. The din of battle arose to heaven, for all were fighting at once, and the storm of missiles darkened the sky. Knowing that they were heavily outnumbered, these knights must have been terrified, but they played a crucial tactical role. Their shock attack drew Ritwan's main force forward into the heart of the battle. Mm. His massed troops now began to push the crusaders back, and the Aleppans most likely felt that victory was at hand. In fact, this was the moment for which Beaumont had prepared. Ah, see, I was wondering what exactly his plan was, why Beaumont was holding back. Um, but, you know, we've seen his success before. Clearly, he was waiting. He had something in mind that we're about to see. The author of the Gesta Francorum, who was amongst Beaumont's troops, wrote an impassioned description of this attack. Mm. So Beaumont, protected on all sides by the sign of the cross, charged the Turkish forces like a lion which has been starving for three or four days, which comes roaring out of its cave thirsting for the blood of cattle. Wow. <laughs> his attack was so fierce that the points of his banner were flying right over the heads of the Turks. I mean, this is quite the description, by the way. I, I appreciate the literary flourishes taken. The other troops, seeing Beaumont's banner carried ahead so honorably, stopped the retreat at once, and all our men mm. in a body charged the Turks, who were amazed and took flight. Our men pursued them and massacred them right up to the Iron Bridge. Wow. I mean, so this is a just a classic rallying charge. You're being pushed back, you're badly outnumbered, and the leader of your force, in this case Bohemond, really puts it all out there, puts himself at risk, and leads a charge into the enemies, hoping that it will inspire the rest of his knights to push back. And it did. Uh, it was seems to have been a resounding success in this case. The Norman bet the fate of the entire expedition on this brilliant move. And wow. as the fleeing head of the enemy column started to trample those behind them, the knights who followed him recognized his genius. The garrison, having seen Beaumont leave camp once again, attempted a counterattack. I mean, there's a lot... <laughs> bad to be said about the Crusaders, uh, a lot of atrocities that we have seen and will see, but I will say it's clearly a brave group of guys, and Beaumont in particular, maybe I think the praise is best directed at him, he's clearly an intelligent and inspiring leader of men. Um, so there you go. But once again they were repelled. With the battle and booty won, we carried the heads of the slain to camp and stuck them on posts as grim reminders of the plight of their Turkish allies and of Jeez. future woes of the besieged. Despite this success, the Siege of Antioch was just starting, and in the next episode that we're planning to release very soon, we'll talk about how the siege progressed into the battle against Kaboka, the Atabeg of Mosul, who led a coalition of Muslim rulers of the region and tried to relieve Antioch leading to the biggest battle of the First Crusade. Wow. If you don't want to miss this episode, make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button.
please consider liking, commenting, and sharing. It helps. Yes, do all that. Go and like, comment, and share their video. Uh, how about that? We didn't even finish the Siege of Antioch. That's crazy. Um, it's already been going on for a while. The Crusaders are already in a desperate position, so I'm very curious to see how they're going to find success fighting against an even larger uh, force uh, while keeping up this siege that they have not had any luck with yet. Um, yeah, this was definitely a really interesting one. We're seeing... Uh, you know, the Crusades, uh, for the Crusaders, it's a lot of highs and lows. There are some impressive uh, victories where they're um, quite badly outnumbered. And then there are a lot of lows, usually caused by a lack of supplies, lack of food, the weather, uh, <laughs> lack of mounts. They're really struggling to stay resupplied. Um, I am curious what exactly is going on with the Byzantines. Uh, kings and generals sort of hinted that they were pulling their support in some way. I'm not sure uh, how true that exactly was, though they still, um, you know, provided a lot of the supplies. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see where we go from here. It's been an interesting journey up until this point. Uh, if you guys enjoyed this video, I'd appreciate it if you would leave a like, subscribe to the channel, and check out my Patreon, which is linked down below. I uh, hope you guys are all having a good day today, and I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.